The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Iowa. Hi, welcome to Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Michael Cunningham was born in Ohio and raised in California. He received his BA in English Literature from Stanford University and his MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Iowa. He is probably best known for his novel, The Hours, for which he received both the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction and the Penn Faulkner Award in 1999. He is also the author of the novels Flesh and Blood, A Home at the End of the World, and Specimen Days, and those are just some of his writings. He's received a Whiting Writers Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Michael Cunningham, it's so great to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So speaking of awards, I understand, well, first of all, you're here as part of the Ida Beam Distinguished Visitor Fellowship. Yes, right? thank you, Ida Beam. Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professor, and then you also recently got the Fairfax Award for Lit Lifetime Achievement in the Arts. I'm thinking about these adjectives, Lifetime Achievement, Distinguished Professor. How does that feel? It makes me feel even older than I actually <laughs> am. I mean, I, I am, of course, it goes without saying, hugely grateful to George Mason University for giving me a Lifetime Achievement Award along with people I idolize, like Joyce Carol Oates yeah. um, and, and Tobias Wolf. Uh, it, the idea of, 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 of receiving a lifetime recognition <laughs> maybe maybe it, it, it probably seems strange when you're when you're 80 I, I mm -hmm. it, 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 it certainly upsets my kind of ongoing conviction that I'm still 18 you're still 18 yeah, yeah. Well, you've done a lot in these 18 you know, since you were 18 <laughs> right I mean you think about it the Just... amount of work that you've done um, since the beginning I want to start from the beginning or almost the beginning um, and we you know we, we know you were at Iowa in 1978 1978 yeah. to 80 but before that I assume you came here for a reason at what point did you decide you wanted to try your hand at this thing called writing I started writing when I was an undergraduate okay. without any particular conviction that I was any good at it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not just, you know, I, I don't, I'm, it's not false modesty. I, I just, um, I just love doing it. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. the first thing I'd ever done that I loved so completely. Mm -hmm. And I just <clears throat> graduated from college and, and kept doing it. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, I had been working in bars and, 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 <clears throat> writing during in the morning it's kind of a, a cla one of the, the one of the classic things that a, right. that a, that a young aspiring writer does and I, I I found myself in this little beach town in Southern California working in I think it was, I think I was working in a bar in a Mexican restaurant at that oh, point yeah. um, not, not, it, <laughs> it was not it was not it was not a glamorous or or, or fabulous life and mm -hmm. I, I didn't I didn't really know anybody at that point in that little town in Southern California who had ever even read a book, oh, much yeah. less yeah. could talk to me about my desires to write one. So with some trepidations, I applied to a couple of MFA programs mm -hmm. and, and, and was accepted at Iowa and came here. Yeah, fantastic. And then when you were here, you were here in the late 70s, again, you graduated in 1980. What was Iowa like for you? Had you been to this part of the country before? I had never been to Iowa before. Mm. I... I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I loved Iowa City. Mm -hmm. I loved my two years here. They weren't always easy, of yeah. course. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when I was here, it was it was competitive. Mm -hmm. I, 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 mm -hmm. I hear I hear I hear that uh, I hear that it's not quite so hard on students now as yeah. it as it was then. But it was a little mm -hmm. bit of a piranha tank when I was here. Yeah. But the funny thing is. That was good for me in a way. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for me. It was mm -hmm. difficult for all of us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was this sort of hippie-ish kid mm -hmm. from Southern California who had been sort of trying to write and, and, and unsure about whether mm -hmm. <sighs> writing fiction was even enough to do mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. a life. What about... What about world hunger? You know, right, what, right, what you gonna, yeah. you're gonna, I'm gonna write. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna write down stories exactly. as 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 the world collapses, mm -hmm. and there was something about that very rigorous, competitive environment. Mm -hmm. There was something mm -hmm. about having big, ugly 
fights in mm -hmm. seminar rooms mm -hmm. with people I, I knew to be intelligent mm -hmm. and gifted mm -hmm. that kind of woke me up, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of made me feel like I was a member of this, this sort of quarrelsome right. SWAT team and that we were all engaged. I, sp yeah. I spent, it was two years in a place where everyone agreed mm -hmm. that nothing could possibly matter more mm -hmm. than writing a beautiful paragraph. Right, right. And that made a huge right. difference to me. We just had a exhibit here in which there is a documentary, a little short documentary called A License to Write, and I thought that was a very apt title because I felt like for many of the people who spoke in that, in that um, documentary, and mm -hmm. these were workshop students and alumni, they said, this place gives you permission yeah, I to said, think he's crazy. Right yeah, 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 you know, you know it's like the, the, you got the little tattoo, you know, that you get well, where it true. says that you're, it's yeah. Tr it's mm -hmm. true. I think it's one of the things that I, 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 I've, I, I'm not teaching right now, but I, I've taught mm -hmm. for years, and it's yeah. one of the things I always talk to my my, my students about, the, the sort of under, I think under-recognized sense of shame, mm -hmm. of yeah. embarrassment mm -hmm. that you can feel as a young oh, writer. Like, it's, okay. it feels <laughs> presumptuous, it, 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 it feels embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, and here, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not just the workshop, but also Iowa City in general, definitely now with the Writing University, but when you were there, you know, with, you know, writers walking down the street and, you know, you pass by and, somebody's working on whatever their next you know work is it is kind of an oasis isn't it well that's part of what's so great mm -hmm. I think about the program at, at yeah. Iowa is you are by definition mm -hmm. a member of the community you yeah. can't help but be a member of community yeah. it, it, it's not like I mean there's a great program at uh, Columbia where I where I, I, I taught for years but when the workshop was over everybody everybody vanished mm -hmm. into 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 Manhattan yeah. and here for for better and sometimes for worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these are your people yeah. this is your community this is, this is who you are living mm -hmm. with and fighting with and and having affairs with right. well I didn't, I didn't <laughs> but some people did um, and you know Spending all your time with, right? And there, exactly. there's really there's and there's nothing like that out there. There, mm -hmm. there is no Paris in the twenties. No. There, there, there is there is no Bohemian quarter of any city mm -hmm. where the poets gather at at, at night to, to 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 discuss sonnets right. and the future of the novel. Right. This is about the closest thing I know. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, I have yeah. to say. And still, you know, after all these years. Yeah. Um, something you mentioned about this place being hard for you. Now, I know when I was here, I found, I came not thinking, I, I didn't have a huge literature background, mm -hmm. and I felt very underread when I came here. And one of the education, one of the best things about my education here was that I felt like I became a much better reader. Now, there was a recently a Newsweek article with you where you talk about your, so some of the books that you enjoy. Obviously, Mrs. Dalloway is a big one, which we'll come to in a second. Right. But I thought it was interesting what you said about books that you revisited but was, were disappointed by. Oh, yeah, yeah. The time. You yes, mentioned the books yes. by C.S. Lewis, which yes. I, I had the same experience. I wanted to bring that up because I, 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 that's a, the set of books that, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia and some of the other things he wrote. I loved those when I was a teenager. And then after I went through the workshop and came out and I started rereading some of these things, I'm like, oh. I was kind of disappointed. Oh, no. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, <clears throat> I, 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 I'm always a little reluctant to, to badmouth any writer, living or dead, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in, a, in a magazine like Newsweek. Yeah. But yes, in, in fact, uh, for, for, forgive me, ghost of C.S. Lewis. Yeah, I know, me too. Yeah, I mean, I, I was so, in, but I was so enchanted by those yeah. books as a, as a kid. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, and the, the prose is clumsy and the Christian allegory is yeah. sort of heavy handed and, yeah. and a little creepy. I didn't yeah. see that before, but yeah. now you no. know. I see, but but again, this is all part of our education. Well, you sure, know? sure, and and there there are there are there are there should be books mm -hmm. that transport you at fifteen, and then and then and then don't seem like much of anything yeah. at, at 30. Yeah. That, that's the way it that's ought to be. That's just how it goes, you know? Yeah. Um, now, in terms of getting you launched out <clears throat> here in this this lifetime career that you've had so far, um, your first major novel, A Home at the End of the World, was based on a short story called White Angel that appeared in The New Yorker. Yeah. And it was, what I love about this story, I mean, well, there's, of course, it grew from, from there, the novel grew from the story, but that there's a pivotal event that I'm not gonna go into, but it, it, that it was based on a real event. And I think about resonance and how writers get their material, you know, and where it comes from, that something like that could resound so strongly, and again, I'm not, I'm not describing it, but that it could grow this novel. Did you find yourself, when you were writing this novel, kind of being pushed along? by this this event or were you I, I guess what I'm asking you is how you grew the novel from that short story. Sure, sure, sure. The <clears throat> the story um in, in involves a sort of very unexpected violent 
mm-hmm. death. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it's the older brother of, of this, this, this kid mm-hmm. who kind of worshiped, is, is the much worshiped older brother and something, right. and something terrible happens to him, um, which is, I didn't have a brother, but I was mm-hmm. something, I, 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 knew a, I, I, I knew a kid who yeah. had a terrible accident when, when, and when I was much younger. And uh, I honestly am not sure mm-hmm. where novels come from, mm-hmm. uh, but I think that awful thing that happened to that poor boy so many years ago and that, that, that sense of, of terrible loss that, yeah. that, that all of us who had been his friends mm-hmm felt, um, did sort of push me to try to write a novel about a profound and complicated friendship. You know, love comes in so many forms, and love rocks, and love rules, and love will be here when we're all dust. (laughs) And it comes in so many forms, and I've always been a little curious about, about, about the fact that that romantic love accounts for about ninety nine percent of the literature. Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the other one percent is is is, is the, the story of, hero- of heroic mothers who sacrifice for their children. Right, exactly. <laughs> but I just right. I just feel like, but what what about what about friendship? What about yeah. what about, and and any other kind of love you can Families. make? It feels yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I'm kind of leaping ahead here to specimen days only because of the fact that you have made these these people who are, again, I, I think of it as a novel that kind of shifts these relationships all over, but at the same time, there's this common thread of love and connection that right. are going through. Um, so let me now back up again to your major work, which was The Hours. And now, speaking of a, a book that influenced you, this book, for those people, those few people who don't know, that this book um, was, as you call it, a riff on the novel Mrs. Dalloway, which you read at the age of 15 and can say that is like the seminal novel of your life that made that it inspired you to be a writer? Well, I certainly cashed in big you on that one. You did all right, you know? You, you did all right. No other novel has paid off for me no, the way Mrs. Dalloway no, did, that's for I sure. I tell you, you know, and you'd had a couple of novels under your belt at that point. Now, my question is, what made you decide to take it on? Because I seriously, I read this book and I'm thinking, man, and I feel this way about Specimen Days as well, how did you have the nerve? I mean, that's how, that's my honest, you know, because a book that's valued, so venerated by others, not just, you know, but, you know, a lot of people love Virginia Woolf. And then to actually go into Virginia Woolf's head and try and show this day in 1922 or 23 when she's trying to work on this, you know, what made you decide to dive in and take that on? Well, for one thing, I mean, I, 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 think, I think if you're any use at all as a writer, mm-hmm. you have to have the nerve. You have mm-hmm. to take the risks. Okay. You have to be willing to go down in big blue flames. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, what good are you? Right. you know, what's 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 the what's the point of you? Mm-hmm. We all mm-hmm. <clears throat> we already have more books than we can possibly read in right. a, in, a, in a lifetime. If you're not willing to to push it in some way, mm-hmm. um, you know, I also I I I'd, I'd wanted to do something. Mm-hmm with or about Mrs. Dalloway for so many years. And I, and I, I kept thinking, I'm not ready to stand too close to Virginia Woolf. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't have the facility yet. Yeah. I'm not talented enough yet. <laughs> I'm not smart enough yet. And at a certain point I realized, you know, I'm never gonna feel talented enough or mm-hmm. smart enough. Mm-hmm. You never you never feel fully qualified for right. the task at right. hand. So you might as well just go ahead and do it. Is this like parallel to having children? You know how they say that? You're never gonna yes. be ready, right? Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, I, think, I think it's very it's very much the same thing. So you thing. might as well just dive in. You're never gonna be ready, so yeah. just go ahead and do it. And yeah. it's fantastic, you know, yeah. You know, I wanted to talk about teaching real quick um, mm-hmm. because you said you're, you're not teaching now, but you did teach at Brooklyn College. And yes, in Columbia places. before that, yeah. In Columbia before that. What kinds of goals did you have for your students in, cla- in your class? Classes. Did you have a particular? What did you want your students to come away with? Well, my 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 singular desire for for all of them was that they reinvent literature and yeah. and, and, <laughs> and take it someplace it's never been before. Mm-hmm. Though of course, hardly anybody ends up doing that. Yeah. Um, my main desire, I think, with my all of my students was to do what I could to help them find a voice that was uniquely theirs Mm -hmm. and the stories that only they could tell, Mm -hmm. which 
involved as much unteaching mm -hmm. as it did teaching. Yeah. I probably spent as much time trying to talk my students out of sort mm -hmm. of established things they had right. found their way into as I did trying to teach them new things. Yeah, yeah. Did you have particular books that you recommended for them or stories that they would read? I would, I, I was constantly recommending books and yeah. stories to them, but, but different books and different stories for, right. for, 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 for different, different students. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, I, I, I actually came to feel like a sort of literary psychopharmacologist right. after a while. And I would, I would say, okay, you, you read this, right. this and this, you read that. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to learn about plot, so you need to read this. Yeah, you need to learn yeah. About sometimes, this. sometimes it's, it's sometimes writers who are doing something like what you're trying to do. Sometimes it's writers who are doing something completely different from what you're trying to mm -hmm. it, it, you, you kind of do this by the by instinct, by right. the seat of your pants. Exactly. Yeah, enough it, enough experience with teaching, you start seeing that. You start seeing how you can speak to an individual student. I think it's like doing any job for long right. enough. Your, your instincts sharpen up. You begin. You you you're after ten years of it, you're better than the, than you were at mm -hmm. the beginning. At sort of knowing. Oh, I know. I, I think I know what you need here. I think I know what you need. I, I think I know what you're book. what you what you what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. I think I know what might unlock it. Yeah. So while I was doing research for this, uh, I found an interview from WMYC in 2004 where you and William Eddings and the Brooklyn Philharmonic did a yeah. concert that featured your work and the mu and music inspired by your work, but also music from the hours from that lovely Philip Glass yeah. soundtrack. And I just thought it was fascinating because you said in the art in that interview that you actually listened to Philip Glass while you were writing the hours. I did. Yeah. I did. See how things how things turn around. That and is come synchronicity around. at yeah. its finest. Yeah. Do you listen to music on a regular basis when you write, or I love 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 music. Yeah. I, I suppose if I had even a whiff of talent. <laughs> I would be, I would be a musician. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, of course, I love language and I love storytelling and I love books. Uh, I wouldn't want to say I love music more, but let's say this: if an extraterrestrial arrived on Earth yeah. and said, "What can you tell me?" Mm -hmm about what it is to be human, you would probably play a Bach cantata. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, would be, it would be more Goldberg variations than, than Anna Karenina. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just because Anna Karenina, not because it's less great, but because it's local. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so steeped it's in context. It, mm -hmm. it, involves, it involves language, right. which, mm -hmm. which our visitor might not, you know, might not be able to read Russian yeah. or, or, or an English translation. Um, since I was a kid, music has always mattered to me. About as much as books have mattered, not more, but mm -hmm. certainly not certainly not less. And and and, and so I, I I feel like it always sounds a little pretentious to talk about one's early influences. But my <laughs> but 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 my early influences mm -hmm. feel equally derived from Flaubert and Bob Dylan, right. Um, right. from from you know, Chekhov and and Neil Young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because one of the things you learn from great musicians is one of the things that's reinforced is is the musical qualities of of, of language. Right, right. Maybe maybe you want this paragraph to sound like subterranean homesick blues mm -hmm. <laughs> to whatever extent possible. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Maybe you want this to sound like Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's no way to talk about that really beyond no. but 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 it's something you feel and 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 when you listen to enough music yeah. i find that it it i hope it finds its it finds its way into the rhythms of the sentences right. that i write right i when i was a kid i discovered totally randomly i discovered bela bartok Okay. Mm. Now talk about coming completely out of left field. As someone who, you know, my experience of classical music was doing Mozart etudes, all right? No, nothing that really turned me on, but to hear a uh, Bela Bartok violin concerto, which, again, this was playing with the medium, just like, you know, we play with the medium in literature, the, the ways in which classical music, and then, of course, later on with rock and roll and jazz and all the other hip hop, everything, the way in which artists play with it, it's the exact same thing. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's awesome. I, it's, it's an amazing thing to, and to be able to learn from that and to bring it into the writing. I'm even seeing, yeah. I remember being a kid and writing to Bela Bartok and just seeing what comes out, you know? Yeah. That's yeah, really, yeah, yeah. that's really great. Well, it's something, it's something I, 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 another thing I talk to my students about, is that, um, a paragraph read to somebody who doesn't speak English shouldn't sound like nothing at all. Right. 
it should it should have a force and a momentum, and you should and you must remember that language has musical as well as meaningful aspects. Right. And think about not only the rise and fall of this sentence, mm -hmm. but then the next sentence. Right. Maybe so maybe the next sentence wants to be wants to be more staccato mm -hmm. because the previous sentence has been has been long and flowy and baroque and clause riddled. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things, I don't know if you can get that if you don't, you have to read a lot and you have to read very widely, mm -hmm. reading lots mm -hmm. of different writing. Mm -hmm. And again, we're grateful that we have so many different writers who do so many different things with language. And yeah. then, yeah. you know, I find some of your work, there's, there's a poetic quality in some parts of your work that, that, pay, that, that demonstrates the attention to language and the importance of sentences. You know, let me put in a plug again for the workshop. This is one of those things I learned about how important the sentence is, how important a paragraph is, yeah, yeah, you know, and that you, yeah. people get into fights over that kind of thing, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's, it's a, an amazing it's thing. It's something actually worth fighting about. It Imagine is. Imagine that. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. We've just been talking with Michael Cunningham, who's the author of The Hours and several other novels, screenplays, poetry collections, TV series. We look forward to seeing more of his work. He is visiting here at the University of Iowa as Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professor. I'm Keisha Lynn. Thank you for joining us from Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. The preceding program was produced by the University of Iowa in association with the Big Ten Network.